Wherever you are in the world, welcome back to Jerry's Take on China and part two of a look at the laws protecting Chinese people. Yesterday, I spoke about China's constitution and the right to protest, which we now know is very alive and well. Today, I'm going to look at another aspect of the Chinese constitution, religion. What's banned and, more importantly, what's not. My wife is very interested in Buddhism. I wouldn't quite describe her as a Buddhist, but certainly she's an active and interested participant. Last week, I was invited, not for the first time, to attend a training session, which I did. I had only one real question when I sat down with the teacher at the end of the session. If this is allowed, why are organizations like Falun Gong banned in China. And he told me some people deliberately disrupt the country's order. They harm their followers or they do it for money. If any of those factors exist, then the country would ban any religion. Falun Gong's leader is a multi-millionaire. He encourages his followers to abstain from worldly pleasures, including sex, even for married followers. He teaches that Medicine is poison, and only by following his way can he help to cure any illness. So many people have either died for lack of treatment, or they've committed suicide, which seems to be another thing he does encourage. Given what I know about Falun Gong, it fits all the criteria of a cult, and should or probably would be banned anywhere. Now if you want to know how insidious Falun Gong is, Watch Australia's ABC expose of them, or read a report linked to that from former practitioner Ben Hurley, or read Ben Hurley's blog, and read what the Chinese official line is. I provided a link to the Chinese embassy's response in Q&A in Latvia, the country where the Falun Gong was taking a hold. Cults can be very dangerous. Do some research into the Tokyo sarin gas incident the Jonestown Massacre, or the Waco, Texas Siege, that's in the USA. Links are provided. And if you know anything about the Taipin Rebellion, where a disgruntled former official claimed to be the brother of Jesus Christ, or the Boxer Rebellion, where they call themselves the Righteous and Harmonious Fists here in China, you'll see why so much care and attention is paid by Chinese government into the formation of and prevention of cults. Once again, when we look at China with a slightly different lens, we find something is completely the opposite of what we believed. Within 10 minutes walk of my apartment here, there are three churches. Two years ago, before I was doing Jerry's Take on China, I made a short video showing these and dozens of other churches and mosques in China. And once you know this, it's hard to believe that religion is banned. It's even harder to understand why do so many people believe it? Article 35 of the Chinese Constitution is very clear. You can believe or you don't have to believe. It's up to the individual. However, it does add a couple of caveats. You can't engage in religion that affects public order. In other words, no extremism leading to terrorism. If your religion impairs the health of any citizens, that's a no-no. So there's no blind faith in the ability of a religion to heal you without medical intervention. And finally, no interference with the educational system of the state. So there are no ecumenical schools. Everyone learns the same thing when they go to school, and everyone has an equal chance at the same exams. Now, none of those seem unreasonable. But there's one spot where people might take offense, especially if they have a strong Catholic upbringing. The Vatican, a city-state which is led by the Pope in Rome, has no sway over the direction of religion in China. If you want to be a Catholic in China, you can be. If you want to follow the Pope's guidelines, you can. But the country will make no laws to accommodate you. Now, is there anything unreasonable about that? I don't think so. I grew up a Catholic, and I can remember when we were young, 
My mother scampering around to find change to put into the collection plate every week on a Sunday. It was worse at holiday periods such as Easter or Christmas because as well as finding money for the gifts or the eggs for her five sons, numerous nieces and nephews, my mother also needed to find additional money to put into the collection plates for what was at that time the richest organization in the world, the Catholic Church. It's no longer the richest organization in the world. But that's not because the church has given its wealth to help poverty in places such as South America or Africa. It's because companies like Amazon, Tesla, Apple, many other organizations have overtaken the church's estimated 20 to 30 billion dollar fortune. The truth is, and I say this as a person who is disillusioned with religion globally, China is a place where if you want to celebrate your God, your philosophy, or your way of life, the country will not only allow you, they've written a law to support you and to prevent anyone from stopping you. And if your detractor or your debater wants to tell you that's all okay except for Xinjiang, it's not. Xinjiang has more mosques than the Middle East. It has more per believer than almost any other country in the world. In fact, there are over 24,000 mosques. There are even more in Gansu, Ningxia and Inner Mongolia. There's also a huge mosque in Xi'an, several in Beijing, and the oldest mosque, I think, in Asia is in Guangzhou. So when the detractors, as they will say, that's not true, they've torn down more than 16,000, which appears to be the number floating around the internet, you can ask for evidence, but it won't be forthcoming. As with the protests, what will be forthcoming will be headlines from media which quote ASPI, the organization that employs a 20-something-year-old expert who's never entered China in his life to assess from satellite images what's going on in a region I've traveled through and seen with my own eyes several times. ASPI have reported that as many as 16,000 mosques have been destroyed or damaged. Although the extent of the damage isn't known, it might be that they took off a wobbly minaret and for some reason ASPI seems to think of that as cultural erasure. There is no religious oppression. It isn't true. ASPI's own report estimated that there were fewer than 15,500 mosques still operating. The rest have been destroyed or damaged. What is true is that many have been renovated and reopened. Let's for a moment give ASPI the concession we know they don't deserve, but there are still, in their words, almost 15,500 mosques, and that's 12,700 more than the USA has. I can promise you, religion, if you adhere to it, is alive and well in China. My friend Shen in Shenyang, Mario Cavolo, is a Catholic. He attends church regularly. I also have a few friends here in Zhongshan who do so. They're mostly Chinese. And I said in the introduction, even my wife is inclined towards Buddhism. So religion is alive. I'm not sure what else I can say except that if you're interested, visit China. If you have a religious belief, Know now that the company is opening for visitors and traveling around is a lot less problematic than it was, you can visit and see for yourself. And once you do, you'll know and you can return and tell your own congregation that they've been misled and lied to. Once again, thank you for watching and please do the right thing. Like, share, subscribe and help me to get this message out. Also, Please feel free to read and share the attached article. Confirm any or all of the supporting documents that I've linked in there and ask any questions that you might have in the comments section. I'll do my best to answer them. But for the time being, thanks once again for listening to Jerry's Take on China and I'll see you next time.